Hi students, this video is gonna cover foreign direct investment. It's probably one of the most important things for a society, especially from a macro point of view. Foreign direct investments will help build societies. So I hope you will enjoy it. This video covers foreign direct investments. A foreign direct investment, or FDI, is an investment made by a firm or an individual in one country into a business uh, located in another country. Generally, foreign direct investment takes place when an investor establishes foreign businesses operations or acquires a foreign business asset in a foreign country. However, foreign direct investments are distinguished from portfolio investments in which an invest investor merely purchases equities in a foreign-based company. Foreign direct investments is actually one of the most wonderful things that could happen a nation state. That is when someone comes in with a bunch of cash and says, hey, I want to invest in your community. I want to spend it here. I want to make you guys rich. Yes, I will get a return on my money, but you will also be a part of the ride. Some of the global trends in foreign direct investment often involves the establishment of uh, production facilities abroad. Uh, when the Western world decided to actually invest in China and have our production outsourced there, we put in a bunch of money into China. And that's how China became so successful and so rich so very fast. The bad thing is that when we invest somewhere else, example, uh, in China, they will benefit from that investment while uh, people in our home countries in manufacturing, they will then not do so well. They will become unemployed, have to go back to school or try to re-educate themselves. Typically, they end up being poor. Another trend in foreign direct investment is greenfield investments that are involving building new facilities from the ground up. Now, if you remember uh, the lessons from uh, David Ricardo, where if two countries are actually trading with each other, then they're both better off. Well, we have sent over a bunch of money to China, and now they have figured out that the best thing they can do is actually do greenfield investments in the United States, where they build more sophisticated factories in the United States compared to that of what they have in China. And that way they don't have tariffs, they don't have shipping and other risks involved with transporting uh, goods over uh, oceans and state lines. That's a very positive thing. Another thing that is maybe uh, not always so welcome, this cross-border uh, acquisitions when you buy a business somewhere else. Sometimes businesses are very concerned about that, uh, especially in the, uh, the, the business that's being taken over. And those communities typically don't like it and sometimes it's very politically charged. Uh, but still, a very important part uh, and allows uh, entrepreneurs to maybe cash out on their hard-earned work. So naturally, several developed uh, nations, um, such as nations within the European Union, Canada, and the United States, have seen a lot of um, outflows of cash from our uh, uh, nations to uh, developing uh, countries, mainly because uh, labor is very cheap and typically land is very inexpensive and uh, and we build new factories there that are maybe cleaner than the ones we have here uh, and that creates jobs somewhere else but it loses jobs in the domestic country we can't just assume that money is flowing one direction in the end of the day money flows two ways we might not necessarily see how the flows work and it might not necessarily benefit the ones that gave up something, like a job. Here's some old statistics now, from 1999 to 2004, as it covers the annual uh, foreign direct investments in billions of dollars. Um, and, and if you look at, for example, um, this would be uh, France, a lot of money flowed out of France and probably over to China. Now, uh, the blue line, uh, would uh, indicate inflows and the red would indicate outflows. So if you look at, for example, where's China? China, in this case, they only had inflows, okay? 
uh, but since 2004, even more money flowed over. So the years b uh, between 2005 and 2020, lots of money has flowed into China, much more than uh, $46 billion uh, on an annual basis. Now, the United States has had a fairly stable trade balance. So when investments are done across the borders, uh, uh, greenfield investments is when you build a new facility from the ground up, cr cross-border acquiring, buying uh, businesses or factories uh, might mean that you buy an existing uh, factory. It might also mean that you actually buy an existing factory and expand the business in that uh, country to make it more efficient. So typically when you build something, Greenfield investments are very welcome, where cross-border um, acquiring of assets are typically unwelcome. People get very concerned about that, and it's typically used in politics. So why on earth would we invest overseas? Well, sometimes you have the problems of trade barriers. So that means that when uh, President Trump decided to uh, start a trade war where, uh, with trading partners and say, hey, we want... Uh, trade to be fair uh, if you guys um uh, can access our market at a tariff and i'm making this up now at five percent but if we want to access your market it's going to cost us 50 percent well there's 45 percent that we're going to argue over and um naturally a country would say well we don't want to give up our 45 percent that uh we benefit from in comparison to the 5% that we go into your market. Um, but then President Trump might say, hey, we will punish you for this. And that might sometimes take a long time before uh, the governments come into agreement and sign a new trade deal. So that means that companies might not know how long this is going to last and therefore decide that the trade barriers are such a risk that it's better to actually build a new factory and that's faster than the negotiations of governments um, in a new country. So the Chinese might say, hey, if you guys are buying a bunch of um, uh, hard drives, we're going to build a hard drive um, and computer component factory in the United States. That way you don't have to have it shipped and then it doesn't have to be, um, uh, you, you know, all these customs wouldn't be added to it. So we can do this at a, a lower expense and that's probably the reason why we would actually uh, avoid the trade barriers by engaging in greenfield investments. Um, another part might be a labor market imperfections. Maybe uh, a European firm might say, do you know what? Uh, I love Europe and all that. I would love to hire people here, but the unions here drive me absolutely nuts. So I'm going to simply move my factories uh, to a, uh, a country that don't have the same regulation when it comes to unions. And that way, I don't have to have that headache and I can just focus on making money. Uh, sometimes it's uh, trying to get your hands on intangible assets. Uh, other times it's about uh, vertical integration or um, uh, changes in product life cycle when it comes to your products. And, and in many cases, it's diversification when it comes to the shareholders. Because trade barriers is such a big part, it has to do most of the time, almost always, about government actions that leads to market imperfections. And these market imperfections makes it very challenging for business to have a outlook on what they could expect uh, going forward so they can plan for their cash flows. Tariffs, quotas, and other restrictions on the free flow of goods and services and people and money uh, will make it very challenging. Sometimes trade barriers can rise totally natural by either having oil prices uh, increase significantly and it becomes very expensive. Uh, but uh, like what we've had in 2020 with um, the shutdown of a lot of countries because of the pandemic of the coronavirus, oil prices has diminished. But at the same time, there's no one shipping stuff and therefore we might not be able to get stuff from China when we order it because they might not be open for business due to uh, managing the disease of the coronavirus. And therefore, we have to figure out how do we start up production locally to uh, take care of uh, the situation that we have. 
So, uh, labor market imperfections has to do with the cost of labor. And labor is one of the very big uh, factors in production besides land and capital and entrepreneurial spirit. Now, these, this information here is very old. Um, it's based on the um, U.S. Uh, cost of labor in 1997 and then also again in 2015 and 2016. Um, but here we can look at um, how it's changed in Switzerland in, 20, uh, in 1997. It was uh, about $30 per hour worked, uh, while in 2016 uh, it was roughly $60. Um, Sweden uh, was uh, roughly $25 uh, dollars, uh, per hour and has now increased to $41. Um, in comparison, uh, the cost of production in the United States was $23.97 and, uh, and roughly $39 per manufacturing hour uh, in 2016. Now these numbers uh, look at uh, the cost to actually hire someone. There's a lot of social expenses involved. Okay, you uh, pay um, uh, all kinds of extra insurance. You might have retirement. You might have pensions. You might have uh, uh, other liabilities. You might have union fees. All these things that needs to um, uh, compensate uh, uh, the cost of a labor hour uh, for a worker in different countries. Another side of foreign direct investments is looking at the product life cycle. Now, assume that you have a very uh, complicated uh, new product uh, that might need to be produced in the United States because it requires uh, a lot of education. You can't really streamline it and mass produce it in the beginning. So that means that you uh, have the consumption in the domestic market and as you ramp up um, production, you can start importing. Uh, at some point, um, uh, it will be less expensive to actually move that production somewhere else, and that means that we will actually import it. So, but uh, for a new product, you typically have um, um, the domestic production, and then as it matures, uh, then uh, and when it becomes standardized in production, you typically move it uh, to a foreign uh, country. So, when you look at less advanced countries. Uh, you will have, in the beginning, you would have to import uh, certain technology. Um, and some of those things was, uh, in the old days, like cell phones, computers. But today, a lot of those things are very um, streamlined and matured uh, products. And that allows us to actually use uh, production in less advanced countries. And that means that they can now export it because it's standardized and easy to Build. Some of the political risks are very naturally and uh, unquestionably uh, risky and strange. Some things that we take for granted is that, uh, you know, will a government follow the rule of law? And we would say, yeah, but that's not necessarily true when you invest and do business in some foreign countries. We can't always assume that the um, rule of law is upheld in South America, Africa, uh, large parts of Asia. And in some countries, you just can't enforce contracts. So if we contract someone to build something for us and we give them a bunch of money and we expect a, a, a product in return and they don't ship it, they might just say, too bad for you. And then you say, okay, well, now we have to sue you. And uh, unfortunately, the legal system in that place might not agree or is not friendly or is simply not understanding of your problem. Now, macro risk is uh, something that all foreign operations are at risk to um, because of uh, political developments. Other micro risk might be that it's a select uh, sector that is experiencing higher political risks. An example there is where the steel industry uh, saw a lot of political risk when President Trump increased a lot of tariffs on steel being imported to the United States. So even foreign countries 
and foreign producers of steel will have a political risk in the United States as a result of the actions that the federal government took. Sometimes when uh, you look at political risk, there might be transfer risk, and that's the uncertainty regarding cross-border flows of capital. Some countries might say, hey, you can transfer as much money as you want into our country, but unfortunately, you can only take $500 out per day. Well, that kind of sucks if you're McDonald's and you're selling a bunch of burgers somewhere and now you want to uh, take the, uh, the cash flow there and transfer it back to the United States. You might not be able to do that. Other operational risk might mean that certain countries have very strict uh, policies that dictate how you're allowed to run the business in that country. You might not be in control of your facility. The foreign country and government might simply um, expropriate and take your property and that way you lose control. You invested in something and now it's gone. Uh, someone else is using it and um, they are claiming it's theirs now. And that happened in Venezuela fairly recently. There might be a total political change in the government system in the host country of the uh, area that you're doing business in. Uh, and the volatile shift between political parties might simply not make it possible for you to do business there. You might not simply know what you will be able to do, if it's going to be legal today or if it's going to be illegal tomorrow. So that's why it's important to look at the track record of political parties um, relative to their strengths. In China, although they're a communist uh, country or uh, some sort of a form of uh, uh, state capitalism, or you might want to call it national socialism, where they have total government control over society and goods, businesses, resources, and means of production. Now, they might not change the rules very often, so there's a stability in that, but you have to take the moral decision. Are you willing to take those risks, and do you want to engage in business in a form of dictatorship? Now, how do you manage all this risk? Well, uh, the good news is that the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC is a U.S. government federally owned organization that offers insurance against the inconvertibility of a foreign currency, the expropriation of our assets, uh, destruction of our uh, uh, factories. There might, you know, be war, or revolution, or other types of uh, uh, civil unrest, and we need to be able to insure this. And naturally, there might be uh, business loss due to political violence. All these risks are things that might be hard to buy and you can't just show up at Lloyd's of London and say, hey, we would like to insure our business because we're going to go into Syria and try to help these people here. And um, although they have a civil war uh, and Lloyd's of um, England might say, you guys are crazy. And um, in this case, maybe the Overseas Private Investment Corporation would say it's in the best interest of the United States government and the United States people if you go and do business there. We understand there's a risk involved. We will sell you insurance to cover this risk. Dear students, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe by clicking up here and give me a, and maybe even write a little comment down below. So. I appreciate your help and your support and I hope you enjoy these videos on finance.